Welcome everybody and welcome to the forum number two with the title The Architect as a Researcher. Um, before I, we start with the presentations, um, I would like to say a few words regarding photos. As Juan Trias explained the first day, um, uh, the main title of the photos is The Leap into the Void. The Leap into the Void expresses the moment of the action that lies between the decision making and the realization of its effects. We hope um, that for each of you, the leap into the void will mean something different at the end of the photos. And this is why this year um, we realize or we organize different sessions and also with different um, speakers, always two speakers, different point of views, because there is no uh, only a single reality and every point of view is welcome. Um, for example, now, um, for me, what I'm doing, it's also the, the leap into the void, because I'm, I'm talking in front of many students, um, some professors for the first time, and um, this is the, my feeling, no? I'm feeling that I'm doing the, the leap into the void. Um, what I mean is that somehow we always have to lead with uncertain situations, and we are this year we try to, to give you some tools. Um, maybe in the following years or maybe the next year, some of you, it will make also the leap into the void. And as I explained to my students the first day, uh, it's completely normal to not know what you want to do in the future. You only need to jump. Um, before I start with the presentations, uh, I would like to thank Felipe and Teresa to invite me to participate in Foros. And also thanks to Juan, Jaime, Inigo, Ignacio and Cinta to accept me as a part of the team. Um, today, uh, we are going to talk about the architect as a researcher. Um, research is a space of architectural activity and a field of an opportunity for architects. The architect as a research develops a new role in this sector, uh, encompasses different scales and integrates interdisciplinary knowledge combining the theoretical and the practical. And now I will present you David Zampini and Oriol Carrasco. But first, I would will, I will like to say thanks for accepting the invitation and thanks for coming. Um, David Zampini, the one from my left, from my right, sorry, uh, is the head of Themex Global R&D based in Switzerland. And he leads a multidisciplinary group of top scientists and a specialist leading with new technologies and solutions for the world building material models. Um, he has a civil engineer degree in, by Northwestern University, and he also holds a PhD in civil engineer. And from the other side, we have Oriol Carrasco, and maybe you will know them better than me. He is also a professor in WIC. Oriol has been combinating teaching and working in engineering and architectural fields since 2005. And Oriol is also collaborating with different studies, studios sorry, uh, and companies in computational design, prototyping a real scale mockups, fabrication methods, and construction of complex architectural elements. He studied architecture at WIC. He received his master's degree at Elisaba, and he holds also a PhD in architecture and engineering. And I would like to add that he is part of some research groups like Lithius from WIC and Design with Nature in YAC, and I think so many more, but um, I think it's enough for now. Um, once I say that, uh, I would like to, to start the dialogue or the presentation, uh, giving the floor to Oriol. Um, and I will ask you first a question to start the presentation. Um, we, we discussed this with our students, and I think maybe you will give a, a nice answer. Um, I would like to ask you, what is an architect as a researcher? Okay, I will try to do a response on that on my, on my presentation. Thanks. Okay. Well, well, first of all, I would like to, to thank uh, the organization of Foros and the people involved here for the opportunity to win here in this uh, sort of kind of new 
uh, ways of, of lecturing here in, in week, at least with these participants of, of two people. Uh, for me, it's an honor seeing all of the lineup that we have uh, in the next uh, in the next and previous uh, presentation. No? So I will try to at least that my speech, my intervention here has the level uh, for the rest uh, of the things that we, you will see. No? Um, so today we will speak about the architect as a researcher. No? Um, and then we have always this idea of the research, like guys with lab coats in clean rooms, in labs with a uh, lot of equipment. No? And we tend to think of research as in the medical, medical fields, but not so much in architecture. Uh, even that here in the school, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, but uh, still, if you ask uh, someone in the, in the outside world what is a researcher, they will say lab coat uh, for sure scientist. No, but of course, we as architects can also wear lab coats. If that is our goal, uh, we can. You know, we can pose uh, if that is needed. So um, that, is, that is an important thing to, to take into account, that an architect also can have like, this role of, of research. You know? And I will try to, to give a bit of context in my, in my, uh, in my lecture today. You know? uh, the first thing, going back to the roots, to the etymology of the, of the word, if we start with the innovate, uh, the innovation is this make changes in something that is already established, right? Uh, this is, of course, from the dictionary. But if we do the same thing for research, uh, then we can start seeing that this is a systematic investigation. Huh? So, like, these differences in the two things, I think, are very, very important. Because one thing is to innovate, to do innovation, and the other thing is to do research. Not oppose, uh, sometimes hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, and one comes after the other, and they are always, like, interlinked uh, between them. Huh? Um, <clears throat> if we uh, follow uh, Stephen Johnson's words uh, in, his, in his book, Where Good Ideas Come From, uh, if you haven't read, I would recommend that. Uh, he always speaks about the connectivity and the places. Uh, he always speaks about these uh, coffee houses, the tea houses, where these guys were meeting and were discussing science and they were doing challenges and they were, were trying to, to cultivate or to, to promote ideas and to mix them together and to interweave them together to to achieve a greater goal that in the end was knowledge. No? Uh, you can see like the letters of Maxwell or the letters of Newton or Pasteur or all of these uh, uh, famous uh, scientists that were kind of speaking with each other. No? And that connectivity, that place is what makes the innovation happen or that allows an innovation to, to happen, no? at least uh, from, from my point of view as a, as a researcher. No? Uh, this connection, of course, uh, happens here. No? This is uh, Ramonica Hall's drawings. And an innovation, an idea, is the connection of these two things. And if you are innovating and then you are doing something else, or you are changing what we were saying before, make changing something that is established, this connection happens in a different way. And that different way, or that overlapping, is what is important about the innovation and not about uh, what, what happens in, in, our, in our sense of, of research and design. No? Um, of course, um, I need to speak about Leonardo da Vinci, not to be compared to him, uh, because we are way far uh, from, from, from him. But uh, this interconnection or these um, ideas that keep evolving or that keep mutating or that they are being used for something else, I think is very interesting in, in a figure of, like a guy of, of Leonardo da Vinci, a true polymath, no? that he was... Uh, Painter, engineer, scientist, theorist, architect, draftman, yeah, so all of these things at the same time. So he was studying the wings of uh, birds and then studying the bones under those wings and then proposing machines with the same sort of same uh, ideas, the wings of, of birds. No? In a sort of a semi or kind of biomimesis, biomimicry uh, sort of design research. No? Uh, but again, not to be compared uh, to him, but with this idea of that the, the whole is better than the sum of the parts. Da Vinci was a lot of things, and that combination was, was great about him. No? But in the other side, uh, we have Dyson no? um, from the uh, vacuums. So he was looking at this uh, sawmill and then seeing this cyclone, the dust extractor, how they were getting rid of all of these fine particles and then started working on that own. No? I'm, I'm using Dyson a lot when I speak with, with students. 
because he's a true maker, no? what we consider a, a true maker. He had an idea, he had a vision, he had he saw something and then tried to move it to his field, to product design. No? So this prototyping, uh, it's extremely, extremely important when we are doing research uh, because we can have like a more intellectual research, let's say, but in architecture, what is important or what is needed is this applied research uh, in products, systems, uh, whatever. We can discuss that later, okay. yeah, if needed. But the trial uh, and error uh, of Dyson is extremely we have one The same way as Freyoto when like he was 60, uh, always was. doing these exercises of form finding with sub bubbles, and then these sub bubbles become uh, major faces, and those major faces way, way, way. could become architecture. In 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 this combination, this interconnectivity of different things that could happen uh, at the same time, or in different times, or in different moments, or consecutive, uh, that could create uh, something that is greater than the sum of the parts. No? Um, we have this one in, in, in Lites, in our office, as a constant reminder that you cannot believe what you think when you are designing something. You need to test it, you need to try it, you need to do a prototype, you need to test it again, and then if that doesn't work, you will change it or you will evolve uh, that, uh, that idea or, or that, that element. No? And that leaves us to the, uh, to the architect uh, as a researcher. What is architecture? Uh, what is an architect that research? Or what is the research in architecture? You're going down. Um, from Jeremy Thiel, um, I, I, was, I was reading a, a couple of texts from him, um, and then he had like sure this idea of the myths like of architecture, or the myths right of research in like architecture. Uh, he always Where poses like this three different no, scenarios. The ones that uh, are in like A, sad. which architecture is uh, just architecture, like so oregano, normal rules tomato, of research don't apply in the sense like the, of like, cool okay, there's no trials or there the is no uh, yeah. chemical things that can be tested, but because architecture is so different than any other discipline that it's not possible to do research in that, no? and that would be uh, a myth, part of a myth. No? In the B scenario, is the opposite. Like architecture is not architecture. Uh, so it's a sum of things, and if it's a sum of things, we could study structures, we could study construction, we could study like the spaces and, and so on. And then we could try to evaluate architecture as several elements, several parts that we can kind of in research on that or investigate on things and then uh, in the end that will have value. And on the last uh, scenario, we have the idea of that a building is a building and then it's research and, and everything is done and that has already a value. Uh, which is true to some extent, no? those are myths, so those are not real case scenarios. But in the end, if um, I'm trying to get that from Jeremy Thiel and then put it in a way that can be a bit more easy for us to understand or to at least locate or have a framework of what we are doing, uh, something like that could happen. No? We are doing research in architecture, research for architecture, and research through architecture. And with all of these three things is, uh, what I'm going to base uh, some of the examples that, that I will be showing later. No? Uh, for me, it's very important to, to have like these three scenarios, to see where we are, what are we doing, and for what are we doing. That is the most important thing when we are doing research. Because research, by right, research, uh, there's no point in doing that unless if it doesn't have a public utility or it doesn't have an end goal, uh, there's no point in it. So uh, with those three and continuing with the three, uh, I was thinking in, in these possible three uh, ways. Of course, there are a lot more, eh? and depending on who you ask, uh, you will find more, and then the more specific you go, the more uh, areas that you will get. But um, for me, also what I see or what I'm doing actually is um, a, a research that it has like these three legs or that these three areas, no? in material, in processes, and spaces. And the important thing or the nice thing about them is where they cross. Because you can do um, research on space, yeah, okay, uh, there's a lot of things on spaces or there's a lot of things on materials, but then you don't have an utility or you don't have an application for that. And then these points, like the one, two, and three, uh, where these um, areas overlap, I think are the important ones. No? When we are speaking about material and spaces, uh, no, if you go for, for the uh, modern movement, when they were starting to use concrete, uh, that allowed a new typology, uh, a new space, a new possibilities. Uh, that, that happen. No? If you go for um, material and processes, if you change the material, then that needs a change in the process of manufacturing, for example, that could resolve in a new space. No? And that, that Goldilocks point in the middle, uh, which is very difficult to, 
to achieve, of course, because uh, it's a project that has to have a compendium, at least in these three, of course, because there are several hundreds more that you could research on. No? Um, so yeah, that, uh, that areas, uh, I think, are the, the important ones. No? In the end, uh, if we look back to Da Vinci, those areas, the interlapping areas uh, of, of his research uh, were extremely, extremely interesting. No? Um, I'm extremely uh, grateful that I'm part of the uh, Lites Research Group here in the university. And what is important about the group is that we try to do a similar thing, try to overlapping and then trying to combine uh, different fields. No? Uh, we have the academia, we have the research, as peer research, we have the architecture, and then we have the industry. And then the idea is, okay, how can we find projects that more or less will fit in two categories, for example, or, or three, or if are the four of them, that will be uh, perfect. No? But the important thing here is the underlying of that graph, no? which is the people, the people that is inside of the group. We are all uh, architects, except uh, Pedro, and I think that is very important for a research group, uh, because architects, they tend to know a lot of things in a very uh, varied, in a variety of fields, but they are not experts in any of them. Opposite to engineers, that they know a lot more of a specific field. No? And that capacity of being able to connect or to see through different fields is what makes an architect a great researcher um, in that, in that uh, regard. No? So that uh, is very important. We maybe, with, I don't know, three, four, or ten members of our group, could achieve the level of Da Vinci, maybe, no? or maybe not, but that is not the point, because the backgrounds and the ideas that all of these people can bring to the table is what is actually important. So in that regard, um, I would like to show one of the latest projects that we have been doing in the group uh, with Vicente here um, after, after COVID. No? Um, of course, we know these images, we are aware of it, and as architects, we see that there's a problem. Uh, we, are, we have moved to a typology of housing that doesn't have balconies, and now balconies are, uh, we understand that they are very important for the life because they are adding things to the, uh, to the, to the houses that we cannot find them uh, inside. So this relationship between the insides and the outsides are extremely important. And then we have like this problem that we don't have balconies, right? And then uh, what was proposed uh, originally by Vicence, and then we developed it a bit further, was this idea of creating balconies that could be attached to facades, to existing buildings, for example. And then we could create balconies for uh, houses that didn't have any sort of exterior uh, space before. No? But that is something that uh, an architect would be able to do, right? seeing the reality, seeing what is the problem, and then propose a, a solution. I'm not saying that an engineer won't be able to do it, but if you ask me, an engineer will go and then will try to do something that is extremely specific, while the architect will try to do something that is a bit, um, a bit um, far away in different fields or that are uh, connecting different things. Eh? We are creating a space, yes, so we are like in the first category. Uh, we are creating something that has a material. Uh, this was um, originally meant to be in wood and then um, attached to the facade, but of course has other things that require a sense of engineering, like what is the system of transporting those things, how we can move them in, uh, um, in trucks so they are flat packed and then we can just maximize the transport and then we can reduce CO2 in transport, for example. No? Uh, but this idea, this interconnectivity, uh, I think is what is, uh, what is really important. No? Uh, of course, that got a patent uh, in the end, that was kind of um, uh, one of the elements. But a patent in the end is not the goal. No? Uh, we have the possibility of being Tesla or Edison, no? but also maybe both. No? Maybe we are the ones that are dreamers and that are uh, thinkers and that design and that do prototypes and that try to uh, create uh, better things and not forgetting like the business side of things as, as Edison. Of course, like the line is not uh, Tesla or Edison. Uh, there's a lot of things and a lot of ground in between them. So the position of the researcher, also that is, uh, is extremely important in, in that area, no? in which part of the line is. But again, like a patent is not a goal, it's a, it's a result. 
uh, of the research. Huh? Uh, this is my pattern, my first pattern. <laughs> um, but of course, we have like this, um, uh, like this idea of that the research uh, is not only for achieving that, but a systematic investigation to communicate knowledge. And that is the important thing in here, to be able to communicate uh, the knowledge, no? as uh, Archer will, will say. No? Um, there's a lot of more things that, that we could speak about that, but uh, important systematic, so we are researching, we are being very, very scientific in that area and communicating. No? Uh, coming back to the idea of these spaces, um, here with Diego and uh, Pedro, another colleague from computational design, we have been like doing this ongoing research of machine learning where we are defining a grid. We assign a grid, this grid to monopoly houses and then we change the grid and the machine is able to generate new architecture. It's uh, monopoly houses, so not real architecture, but we are teaching a machine on how to design. Uh, of course, we're starting to that, uh, but yeah, machine learning will be a very, very important tool uh, for us no? in the terms of the dissemination of, of architecture. No? Um, if we move forward to, uh, to other, other research, uh, of course, my line of research inside of LITES is composite materials. So that's why um, here, Itke, that is working in the intersection of processes and materials with uh, carbon fiber pavilions and all of the research that they have been conducting in the years, understanding the material from the beginning to try to propose new spaces, new elements, uh, things like this. Huh? Um, Forster and partners in this case for the uh, Apple Campus Auditorium uh, in the Steve Job Theater, they had this extremely big 44 meters in diameter um, roof that is made out of carbon fiber that you can lift with a crane and then you put it on top of a glass wall, you know, creating thus a new space or sort of a different space as we are used to with a different material that also involves a different process for uh, creating that. You know? um, a, a more small uh, project when with a spiral with Javier, one of my first things that, we, uh, that I did for them, uh, it's a small bathroom, uh, extremely complex with a lot of things that we created the model, the one on the right are prototypes, one to four scale, and then in the end, you create like that space. No, it's, it's a bathroom, but it's a space, but it's a piece of furniture, so something related to the, to the, to the area of, of expertise of, of a space. Then, um, you, for you, for students, if you want to start uh, in research, of course, here we have uh, in week the Catedral Ceramica, that is a, a, a very nice, um, quick, short and to the point um, a scenario for creating an innovation in, in Ceramica, uh, but also in studio. No? This is a picture of, of our studio that we run in, in IAC with, with Javier, but studio is a place where you can explore and then you can use and then put all in practice all of this research that, that you could do. No? And the last thing as a, as a, as a student is a PhD, of course, like the figure of the researcher, no? an architect that uh, can model in 3D, that can control robots, that knows about electronics, uh, but not expert in any of them. No? Um, as a starting point, um, this is like this connectivity of things. No? A big fan of these boats that can fly thanks to uh, innovations in material. So now these carbon fiber winglets, the foils are able to sustain the weight of the boat and they fly. No? And then what will happen if we apply these processes, these materials to architecture? No? Uh, if boats can fly, what can we, we do with architecture not to fly? Um, but then trying to um, put in you know, side to side two of my biggest passions, of course, composite materials, carbon fibers and 3D printing. Uh, what will happen if we designed something with these tools or with these processes, what materials, what spaces could we create? No? And that is the base of my PhD. So I applied to a grant in Autodesk Build Space, a place, again, as uh, Stephen Johnson will say, where ideas, where things can happen, um, extremely well equipped, of course. To do what? To do this, no? to create a new process that is able uh, to create elements in a new, different way, that could be used later on for creating architecture. No? So this is the printer. You can see that 
downstairs in, in our workshop lab. There's the, product, the second prototype of it. So yeah, it interweaves the fiber, extrudes, sort of extrudes, and consolidates the fiber as it goes in, in, one, in one go. So a new process with a material that is not very used in architecture. So what will, what will be able to do with that? No? That's an incognito. Uh, things like this, for example, maybe, where we can put these to a test. But of course, um, we have under that innovation all of this research, uh, very methodical of elements, of tests, of uh, how we can create an element that can put the resin in the polymer where it needs to be to harden the, the fibers and, and so on. Um, yeah, so all of these mechanics. Uh, I was constantly trying to tell these people that I was an architect, not an engineer. Until the end, I could like fabricate, create my own cafe con leche with my own uh, element. No? That it was properly dosed. It has a bit of leaking, but properly dosed. No? <laughs> and this idea of the architect trying to learn new material. No? Uh, I always imagine like these guys when they saw concrete for the first time. Uh, what could you achieve with it? What you, could you do with that? No? To obtain what? What is the end goal of it? No? And uh, of course, like this knowledge of the material is something that is extremely important, at least from uh, my point of view as a researcher in architecture, no? rather than a more conceptual approach. No? Um, the same thing happened when Steve Jobs presented the iPhone. Um, he, people were wondering like, oh wow, yeah, it's an iPod that can make calls. And people were forgetting about the internet, the connectivity of it. No? But the iPhone is great because of its connectivity. And that is the important thing here. Yeah, you can change the world, but you cannot do it alone. You need connectivity. Thank you. Thanks, Oriol. Um, and now I will give you the floor, Davide, and I will ask you if research is associated only with the academic world. First of all, thank you very much for, for having me because if Oriol mentioned that he was extremely honored to be here, I'm even more honored to be here because obviously I'm, I'm an engineer and of course it's to, to be among architects actually is, is it's an honor. And actually you will hopefully see and conclude that after my presentation is that one of my ambitions in life is to become an honorary member of the architectural world. Um, so, and on, on, on top of that, there's something that also excited me about being here today. I mean, you know, I mean you know, I've been here a couple times, and they always talk about the Aula Mania, you know, but no one invites me to the Aula Mania. So now finally I get to be here and present here. So this is really exciting also for me, because they always talk about it, and I'm always like, it becomes a mysterious thing. But finally I discover what it, what it is. Now I just want a quick raise of hand, you know, like, how many of you have, you know, participated in virtual meetings since, you know, say, when advent of COVID, and so probably all of us, right? And it's, we've been many, many, many hours in front of a computer, uh, you know, and, and how do you start your meetings? I can tell you how I start our meetings in our company, you know? As soon as everybody connects and everybody starts putting a PowerPoint on the screen, right? Well, one of the things that, you know, I would like to change is by starting with this, you know? <laughs> this, is, this, is my, this is my puppy. Uh, you know, he's he just uh, about a couple couple months old. Meet, this is Buddha, by the name, his name is Buddha, because when there were three of them, and they were all given divinity names, so I end up with Buddha. But I think it's important, before I start to go into the subject matter, that, you know, I tell you a little bit about myself, because this is a way for me to tell you a little bit about myself and just <sighs> breathe a little bit, right? Before we just jump into the subject matter. Um, so. Of course, I'm not going to have a chance. Maybe I will, and maybe maybe you'll ask the right. Maybe you'll ask a lot of questions, and I'll get to know you better. But this is a way for me to kind of introduce a little bit of who I am, right? So just to also not be so much focused on always on, on what we need to to do, which is make a, give a presentation. Um, now I'm going to start, of course, as always. Now I come from a company, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the company does. But I think here it's important in the sense that sense. That's the context. 
it lets you kind of juxtapose between, okay, what this company's doing, and then what I'm doing as someone who's leading R&D in a corporation. You know? So, uh, you know, I belong to Cemex. Cemex is uh, Cementos Mexicanos. So it's a, it's, a, it's a Mexican company. And, you know, we're a construction materials company, a construction solutions company. And what does a construction solutions company do? Well, you know, we, we offer cement, ready mix, aggregates, and we have another core business that has just recently been developed in our company called Urbanization Solutions, where we're focusing on trying to integrate the different material, material solutions that we have into construction systems to uh, many different business, let's say, that are not necessarily belonging to the cement, ready mix, or aggregates business. This is just, again, to give you context on you know, what we do. The R&D team that I run there is, is, you know, these are the characteristics, you know, so we're about 60 employees, we have different nationalities, it's multicultural, multidisciplinary, and, you know, we're based in Switzerland, but not only, I have also part of my team in, in Mexico, no? And, you know, this is what we do, you know? so we have, uh, you know, let's say capabilities that we have developed, and, you know, the activities that we're focusing on are material innovations, construction solutions, production processes, building information, so also to some extent digital, and we're focusing on, you know, all the important issues today, you know, which are CO2 reduction, urbanization, biodiversity, water management, resource efficiency, and social development, okay? So this gives you the context, and this tells you, okay, what does this company do, and okay, how is, you know, and this is telling, this is kind of a roadmap saying, okay, these are the activities that we're working on, but it doesn't tell you how we're doing it. And the how is the key. Um, so, you know, I, I show you this picture, and I think probably, you know, it reminds you of the very famous picture in New York. And, you know, we always are very much focused on saying, okay, you know, the question here is not what we can do, but what do you want to create? Okay? And this then, you know, is what, for me, triggers, for me, the leap of faith. I have been you know, running our R&D in Semex since 2003, and I've told everyone that you know, when I joined Semex that the R&D for me is a 20-year project where I will start it with a leap of faith. And the subject of, of this presentation actually is, is for me very exciting because it actually rings a bell and resonates with what I've been doing in R&D in Semex, you know, because I've been taking the leap of faith, and I've been taking a leap of faith by betting in architecture. And let me tell you, what I mean by that. So I'm not going to go into the details of the project, but what I want to show you is a number of projects that you know, I started to work in where architects became an integral part of the R&D process at Semex. No? This is one of the first projects where I collaborated with architects from the University of Syracuse. And there I was you know, confronted with the topic of materiality, you know, how to adapt and evolve material characteristics to achieve a goal. No? So this was a very interesting project because I was completely you know, amazed by this project because, because of course being an engineer, I was like, wow, no? Because these architects said, okay, we want to reinterpret fluiding. And I don't know if you know, fluiding is, fluiding is like you know, the, the, the way of decorating, let's say the columns, the Corinthian columns or whatever. No, they, they had decorations, but they were carved in there. But they said, these guys said, okay, we're gonna decorate the column, but in a different way. We're gonna actually plaster tiles on it, but these tiles had to be easy to lift, had to have some, you know, capture some features and be very, very strong. So they said, okay, you know, how do we do that? You know, so I was like, wow, architects, you know, had a very unique idea and they wanted materiality to somehow be able to fulfill that vision, right? So materiality was starting to start to be the language that I started to, to work with. And then with the same kind of architects, you know, we uh, went out and started to dare and provoke. You know, and that was very interesting because, you know, I had the architecture students in our lab and I, I, had, I exposed them to everything that was about materiality of concrete. And then, you know, they, they came up with a question and said, they said, I dare you guys, engineers and material scientists, to actually fold the concrete. So we start to do origami. You know, so I start to, so that opened sí, another dimension. You know, so the daring and the provocation. You know, saying that, hey, you know, this, seem, this is always, you know, seen as a very stiff, hardened material, but, you know, there's a transition of the material from being, you know, in a very fluid state to a hardened state. And why are we not transforming and doing something while it's still, you know, fluid? So the daring and the provocation was something that I learned, start to 
learn. And then I had some architects that also came to me and says, okay, you know, we got to do this, but we got to do this cheaper. And we're going to do it more, more you know, within a creative way. You know? So for example, those, the top part of the, the elements, the dome, dome-like elements, were actually folded. And that folding process actually you know, saved us one-third the cost of the total housing project. Yeah? And using also very advanced materials. Again, materiality. And then the conversation got even you know, more interesting you know, because then it started to become more integral and broader. It says, okay, well, let's talk about urbanization. Let's talk about ecology. You know, how are we going to be able to, let's say, create systems that are going to actually save mangroves, which is one of the serious problems that we have along the coastal lines. So we know the architect became very interesting there because their, their vision of the world was not just, you know, only like, okay, let's, you know, let's design buildings, but it's like, hey, there's a problem. You know, coastal areas are having some serious challenges, and one of them is the deplet depletion of mangroves. And as a consequence of that, you know, what are we going to do about it? And at the same time, you know, we asked the question, I was like, hey, can this type of a solution also solve the issues of urbanization? Because, you know, as, pop as cities became more dense, we said, okay, could we not extend the cities, you know, by recuperating the, the soil in the coastal areas uh, through, uh, through uh, say, uh, the development? So we created these fo floating elements that also are wave breakers, you know? And then, you know, again, coming back again to practical, you know, saying, okay, I want a design, a building that's, you know, good in terms of the thermal efficiency, it's able to provide comfort, but the beauty there was that the you know, architect says, I want it with white concrete, you know? And we didn't think about it, and it was an eye-opening as well. And then there were some architects you know, who just came to us and said, look, I don't know what you're doing, but I want to innovate. I want the most innovative material in these buildings. No? And the architect taught us, taught us that you know, we must aspire to innovate to its maximum. And here, for example, this is a building that has no seal reinforcement whatsoever. We use a very advanced high, you know, fiber reinforced concrete. You can see it's a very ductile and, and bendable material. No? And then, you know, in the course of, of, of this, this jump into, into the void, we came across the group from Matter Design, Brandon Clifford uh, from MIT, and we started to look at the components of history, art, and sense. And that was really a, also a very, 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 let's say, uh, amazing, let's say, interactive session. And I will elaborate a little bit more on this later on. But, but you know, we actually took elements like this one here, uh, where you, you know, we actually created unbalanced so the, pro the, the, the center of gravity was completely shifted, and in this, this body, you actually, you can push it in any direction that you want, but it actually will step back, stand, stand back up again. And, you know, and if you look very closely at the design, because there's a design behind this, and if you know a little bit about the Janus, there's the door towards, you know, it's, 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 it's a Janus because it has two faces, but they're kind of you know, juxtaposing each other. You know? um, and then, you know, inspiration by history, you know, uh, the, the, the famous island, the, the famous statues on, on the Easter Island, how they moved. So, you know, so Brandon Clifford from MIT said, look, he spent, you know, a, a month on Easter Island. He said, you know, I went there and talked to the people there and said, you know, how did these statues actually move? You know? and, the, and, the, and the locals said, well, they actually walk. He says, what do you mean they actually walk? Well, it turns out that, you know, if you tie the top, you know, so if you actually tilt those, uh, those, uh, those statues and actually tie a rope on top, the center of gravity shifted in such a way that you pull left and right, the thing walked, okay? And, and we did use the same concepts there to actually you know, develop a, what we call the walking assembly. So these, all these elements have shifted center of gravity, and so a, a single person can actually move and actually assemble these pieces uh, you know, without using cranes. And then you know, we, we start to even go further and say, okay, how do we engage humans with these structures? You know, how do we actually reinvent space? So, you know, when we, what is the interpretation of space? You know, and, and we went as far as saying, like, you know, space is not just an enclosure, but it's actually somehow delineated by maybe a temperature gradient, by, you know, how people use it. So, we, you know, we created, we use the same concepts of the walking assembly and, you know, and, and even like went as far as saying, okay, can we recuperate 
you know, let's say elements that would be thrown away. Like for example, there we recuperated a, a precast element and we actually added to a concrete that was dumb intelligence. We start to take that element and start to shift, you know, its center of gravity by putting a block of smart concrete on it and allowing us to actually play with that element that is already existing. So, you know, circularity, you know? but at the same time thinking of how to create spaces that can be transformed. So we could create spaces like to become a cinema, to be a social gathering, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you know, then we start to work with architects where biodiversity was at the center of their, of their world and, and they wanted to create life in the concrete. And so, you know, we, we asked ourselves, well, what kind of concrete technologies we could develop to actually stimulate, you know, that birds and animals would grow in it and vegetation of certain types and that they would, you know, go through the course of, of nature. Um, and then, you know, we start to put also functionalities, you know, with the, with the, with this shift of weights as well. So here we actually created a barbecue kind of uh, area, but, you know, let's say if it's winter, uh, those seats would be worn by the, the barbecue while it's cooking. And so, uh, you know, the guys, this is the winter, so people are sitting there, but the seat is very warm because it's also been heated by, by the, by the barbecue. And then, all of this, you know, so all of this experience, all of this inspiration, all of this, you know, broad knowledge that we have derived from making that leap with architects. You know? So an R and D, very, you know, R and D group, you know, typically as you know what Oriol shows, you know, the lab equipment, the lab code, and everything. And finally, you know, we we work with all these kinds of aspects into the equation and what I'm very proud to mention is that you know we actually we started a project uh, and actually even a program called climate concrete here with the with the week the, the, and um, and this is actually a project has, that has materialized so from ideas that were generated through a research project students and professors actually in an and an architectural office actually materialize it into a real solution so this is a facade element that was designed co-created with, uh, with professors uh, in, in an architectural office. And, uh, and today there's, I think, more than 200 elements that are being prefabricated and gonna be mounted on a facade that's actually gonna be able to cool the building down by six to 10 degrees, okay? And that all started because of a research project, because of co-collaboration, because of this process of coming together, yeah? And bringing all those elements, so the materiality and so forth and so forth. Now, so, I, you know, I explained all those projects because I wanted to transmit to you that, you know, you as architects have brought so much to the R&D at CEMEX. You know, you brought those dimensions, those things that I kind of highlighted, you know. But in the, in the same time, also, I was, when I was making that dive, I was, seeing, I was seeing flashes of things, you know. I was seeing about, I was looking at mass customization as, as a concept. I was saying, how do we make the concrete more emotional, you know, because, I mean, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it, okay. When you look at a piece of wood, you know, you get kind of excited and emotional about it. You want to kind of hug it, right? When you look at a piece of concrete, you know, you don't necessarily, the first instinct is not to go and hug it, right? So what my question, that I, you know, one of my leaps there was to say, well, how do I make people fall in love and get emotional with concrete, no? And then we talked about the concept of genius loci, you know, the genius loci. You know? So how do I, when I build something and I'm going to use a certain type of material, how do I actually you know, understand better the spirit of that place and be able to shape the materials and the structures to fit in that context. The holistic approach, as you saw now, as, as, we, as we start to accumulate these different dimensions, design, emotion, uh, history, art, we start to have a more holistic approach to things. So R&D did not just become just creating the material, but it came to create the material, accompanied with the design, being sensitive to the local the local situation and so forth. And then today, of course, the environment is a big issue, you know, the CO2, sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I want to make something very clear, you know, because we talk about, you know, research, R&D, and then we talk about, you know, and I, I'd like to make a distinction between research and innovation, okay? As, and I think, you know, everyone is, is using Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci, I mean, it was very systematic. I mean, if you look at this image, you know, it transmits like, you know, some kind of pattern, order, structure, you know, things are calculated, you know, and things like that. But I think that, you know, that's fine. 
Um, you know, and that's something maybe we can, we can debate. You know, it's, there's, very some, there's a lot of logic and science behind that. I tend to believe that you know, if you want to really truly innovate, you have to explore and jump, and, you know, and, and then there's another jump. You, know? you have to jump into chaos. You need to throw yourself into chaos, complete chaos. And, you know, and you're going to be completely lost because it's, that's the image that you get. You know, you're kind of like completely lost in this wire of stuff that you, know, you can't even untangle for, at the beginning. And the whole process of untangling that is what is going to create the innovation. And it's the most difficult because when you're in that situation, and that's the situation actually that I like to put ourselves in the most, because that's when you, know, you start to say, okay, I'm going to develop a completely new approach. First of all, I mean, I'm showing this diagram because this is you know, known as the 10 types of innovation. Some you know, consulting company came up and said, okay, look, you know, when you innovate, you're not just you know, developing the product, but there are many elements to it. I think the architect is actually the, the 11th element of this innovation chart. Because what is very interesting from the architectural point of view is the approach. What I say to people is that, you know, if you look at the companies that are, you know, that are doing R&D, or maybe if you look at other architectural faculties that are doing R&D, probably all of them are working on the same subject, right? Probably, you know, well, I mean, we're working all on, you know, reducing CO2, and, and we have our, our projects on CO2. But what I always say is that what's going to make the difference is the approach. How do you do it? Everybody's working on the same damn thing, right? And just to show how we extreme we go, so the professor from MIT, Brandon Clifford, we ask ourselves, what, it does, what is magic? And you guys got to ask yourself, okay, what is an R&D team in a corporate you know, environment, you know, who, you know, doing, studying magic? Well, we studied magic for a week. We studied magic and we understand that there's the pledge, the turn, and the prestige. And, you know, and when you erect a building, you know, it's like magic. Right? At the beginning, there's nothing. It's flat. And something happens, and you unveil it, you know, and there's the prestige. Right? So here we were actually exploring how to actually make an obelisk appear out of thin air. That was the objective. How to create the illusion that my construction is a magical, op op let's say, opera. You know? It's a magical feature. feature. So we studied magic for one week. Because we ask ourselves, how can we make something appear out of thin air? OK, so that was one of the research projects that we had, how to erect an obelisk in a magical way. So the approach is very important, you know? So how do you engage? How do we engage with each other? The language that we use. The language has changed. You know, we're not no longer talking about materials. This is my product. This is this product or whatever, but we're saying, what is it that you need to solve? And let me understand how to solve it. Be hands-on. You know, you've got to be touching, feeling, smelling, eating the material. Otherwise, forget it. You know, you're just dreaming somewhere when a sketch. And you have to be able to clearly say, what is it that you're offering? What is the benefit? Why are you doing it, right? And what I always say is that if you build it, they will come. This is from a very famous movie, but that's what I've learned. Is that you know sometimes they tell me, "Why are you doing this crazy thing?" I don't know, but I'm going to build it because I believe in the process. I believe in the collaboration. I believe in the emotions behind it. I believe in the ethics behind it, and I will build it, and they will come. So, what will be your leap into the void? That's the question, and I will leave you with this last video, because this is what we aspire to do. We aspire to have buildings build themselves. <laughs> so again, these are unbalanced uh, elements, but uh, you trigger it, one of the elements, and then they actually self-assemble. Thank you. Well, thank you, Davide. And uh, I think I would like to start with the, the, the divide. Um, we prepare with my students some questions for you. 
And we have um, Yamil and Meital in the third row. So if we have the microphone here, um, I think it's. But these are working or not? No. Sí. We, we, we can yell. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's coming. So it's even Hello? two microphones. Okay, it's working. David, you want, you want us to help you? No. <laughs> I will give you first the, the word to Yamil. Hi, first, very interesting, uh, the way you approach and see research in architecture, because sometimes it feels like Oriol start his, his conference, like something more of a laboratory, not so much part of architecture itself. My question mainly remains on when we as architect or researchers know how to stop or where the you know the research ends if it's from project to project like setting up an objective and a goal or is something that it goes beyond it because with all the constant changes in the world the new innovations that are all over in different areas and different disciplines sometimes there are some research that doesn't end up in one project but give you like the the main idea to develop further and end up with a better and a bigger project later on you know so there's but are you, are you, are you want to take it back? sure of course um i think it depends on what are you researching no because if you're searching on a product for example or for a system the end is maybe near or not that far but if you are searching architecture, uh, you will be researching your own life because your way or your background of creating architecture, even that you don't want to, it will appear in all of those projects that you do consecutively or not. So um, if you are I don't know, researching on spaces, for example, you will be researching on spaces always because there's always something behind it. When you reach to a certain level, there's something to research further, because the farther you go or the deeper you go into research, the more things that you will discover. No? If it's a product, then it's maybe a bit easier to know where to stop, but still you could research forever. So I don't know if there's an answer for that. I guess that it's a matter of, of time and, and, cost, and costs, I think, if you are doing a, a product, let's say. But if you are doing research in architecture, uh, it can be endless. Yeah, maybe, maybe you know, there, there's like maybe two, two ways to answer that question. Though. One is the very, let's say, practical, corp, let's say, uh, company type of uh, answer. And I'm saying like, okay, you have, you definitely have, you know, uh, timelines, and you have, you know, uh, uh, time constraint. You know, let's say when you when you look at, let's say when you're given a chance to innovate, you know, the, automatically they will ask you, okay, is this is this something short term? Midterm or long term, so you have to be wise to say, you know, to say, okay, well, what really it is. But then, you know, once once you know you make a commitment, then you know you need to put all your efforts to to fulfill those those deadlines and, and the time commitments. No. Now, I also agree very much with what Oriol says. I mean, let's say in in what I do, I mean, I never stop. You know, it's a constant uh, uh, battle with almost myself. You know, I mean. <laughs> I don't know, I'm sure Oriol does this too, but you know, there, there, there's always a little piece of paper next to my bed, you know, and I will wake up at the middle of the night and actually, you know, write out ideas or, you know, anything. So I think the research never stops because, I mean, if you're, and I think this has a lot to do with also who you are and how you see your profession and how you, you know, in some ways, I mean, I'm gonna say something, maybe it's not gonna be so popular, but in some ways, you know, when you're doing research, it's difficult to shut off. You know, because you are continuously trying to find always the better, best solution, evolve the solution to the next stage and so forth. No? So it, it never ends. But at some point you have to have that discipline to say, okay, this is good enough for what it need, it's, need, it's needed. Um, but that depends on, I think, there's a very strong human element to it that 
that I can't, you know, and I think that Oriol meant express that, cannot be taught, nor it, can, it cannot be acquired somehow, you know? And it's difficult to explain. But, but that depends from person to person and what, what you expect out of your life, you know? Okay, perfect, thank you. We have another question. Um, um, Meital, I will give you the floor. Yes, I, my question, I think from the talk, both of you kind of seemed like you believe research and architecture, like if you want to research, you can't really build. Like you can be the person to research and build, but for some of us, maybe we're not ready to give up building actual buildings just yet because we're just graduating. So how do you think we can reach that level that you research and you apply it to your projects immediately or in the future? Okay, I'll, I'll take that one this time. <laughs> First, you're not getting away from it, uh, Oriol. Um, well, I mean, that's, well, I think, you know, the project that we had with, with, uh, with, with the WIC and, you know, and, and, uh, and, the, and the Peak Architects office, is a good example. Um, the truth is that, you know, there's, you know, you you need to all. I mean, I think one of the one of the things you know that I have seen is that often, especially when when I was a student and recently graduated, we always feel that you know we are in a silo. And the truth is that, you know, to be able to 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 construct, let's say, great structures or you know, functional structures or uh, and buildings and whatever it may be that you're building or trying to do, you need to collaborate and work with others. You need others to inspire you. You need others to stimulate you. You need so so maybe you know you're very much focused on the applications part of it. Now I'm saying, okay, how do I build this? But I think you always need a you need counterparts in in different directions that you know will be able to challenge and stimulate you. I think, you know, being challenged is one of the most difficult things for humans, you know? It's like when you have an idea and you say, okay, I mean, and you know, what is the tendency for people to say, I have this idea, this is what I, I elaborated, this is what we're gonna build. And all of a sudden someone comes and broke, you know, tips over the castle and you're like, no, 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 but you know, why are you challenging, you know, this idea? But that confrontation is key. So I think the moment you're open and receptive to, to receive that confrontation, that's when the innovation process starts. And I'm not saying that you know that if you're very applications oriented, you're gonna become a researcher overnight, but getting that exposure you know, has taught us in the project that you know, each of us that were in that project, I mean, learn from, from each other to be able to create the innovation. You know, so you know, there were people bringing the material side, there were people bringing the idea side, there were people bringing the engineering side, and that amalgamation is, is key. So I think, need to deviate from the fact that, you know, you're on, on an island, you know, you need to understand that, you know, to make things actually happen and to, to make innovation and new things happen, you need to actually have different voices participating in the forum of conversation. So I think that's the first thing, you know, communication, listen and be humble. So uh, I don't know, Oriol. Okay. I don't know if I understand the question because, um, you, you cannot do, or at least I tend to not do the difference between what is architecture, what is building, and what is research. Like, both things are the same thing. Why cannot I build something while I'm innovating? Why I cannot use products that are in the market in a different way, for example, no? I don't need to have a research uh, project to be able to do one thing that then I will apply to something. No, there's no need to that, no? It, and that's why I was, are putting a lot of emphasis in the in the profile of the architect, you know? like this guy that sees things that can connect things in different aspects or in different ways, that then can achieve uh, something that is very simple maybe or very complex with basic uh, elements that you can find in a shell, for example. No? So when you when you speak about uh, okay, let's build and now we are going to do research, uh, I don't think that should be the way, no? because the the research or the innovation in in, in architecture, if we are doing through architecture which is maybe the part that I'm more interested in, it has to happen at the same time. Thanks. Um, I have also some questions that I would like to ask you. David has the toughest questions, by the way. 
No, no, but I, I, I they have, should have the question. I have two, the, a hard one, and I think the other one, um, it's for everyone here because it's our challenge. But I will start with the, the one for everyone because I want also people from the, the first row to participate. Is the question is how do you see the evolution of the architect in the future? And if it's possible, I see many architects also here, and if you want to participate, you're welcome. <laughs> Does anyone from the <laughs> first row to start? <laughs> what is an architect? That's a good question. <laughs> I'd rather... I just try to put... <clears throat> Uh, a deeper question in the same in, in the same direction. I think that <clears throat> what interests me a lot is the way uh, David, you are in a very let's say in a very hard ambience. You are in the middle, in the core of a very a big company and a very let's say. Um, business-focused company doing something that has been done for the past 50 years and been doing it a little bit better. And I, I remember that when one of the first times we met, you were saying that if this company doesn't understand that somehow that must jump in the void, that must introduce into their day-to-day -day business what we are doing here, uh, this big company, as big as it is, it may have no future. So <clears throat> that's, in another sense, what's happening to us architects. Something uh, more vague, let's say, more not so specific, but it's something that has to do with that. We all architects, ev even though we think we are very fashion, very cool, very uh, we are doing some fancy things, we are doing uh, um, research and so on. But something is happening, and that's why we must jump into the void. So the idea for me and the, the question would be how you manage inside this uh, strong uh, company in order to be able to keep on with your <coughs> ideas no? and to have this kind of balance between vision and execution, no? emotion and business, and craft and industry. Because we have, I think, we have a lot of things to learn about that. OK, I mean, um, I'm going to answer two questions. I'm going to answer your question, uh, Felipe, and then I'm going to answer also the question that was originally asked in the sense of, you know, because it's kind of linked together, no? Um, <laughs> I, I think, Felipe, that the battle never ends. You know, I think that, you know, re, let's say research, you know, let's say doing research is a research in itself. I think that's what I've been showing you guys, you know, is that I have to continuously evolve, adapt myself because it's a very dynamic process. So I think that's one of the key things, is being able to really adapt and evolve in a very quick and agile way. And at the same time, being courageous enough to stick to what you believe in. No? So, but it's a balancing act. I think it's like nature. No? Nature is always, let's say, getting disequilibrated and then finds an equilibrium. No? Disequilibrated and finds an equilibrium. So this is kind of what happens. That's how I kind of describe what happens to R&D in a big corporation. No? It's like corporation has business objectives and you need to actually, you know, you know, make sure that you do that, but at the same time, you got to, you know, balance, you know, balance all the, you know, put not all the eggs in the same basket and also have some eggs that are looking forward and taking some risks, right? Because there are a lot of risks that are taken uh, when, 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 we, uh, when we decide to, you know, take on those R&D activities and, you know, and take the leap with, uh, with the architects. So I think that's the key, you know, is to be, always have, you know, the, the courage to be able to play that balancing, because it's tiring. You know, because doing it over and over and over again, maybe, you know, once you say, okay, you have a challenge, that's cool, I, I, you know, I, I overcame the challenge. 
but then he comes another one. So it's like a continuous wave, you know, after wave of challenge, and you have to have that stamina to be able to balance it. No? Now coming back to the to the architects, you know, I think there are two elements that I see with the future of architecture. You know? One is that, and I don't take don't take this the wrong way, okay? But this is what I see. <laughs> I think that architects are not have a very low awareness of their value. You know, in the sense that I showed you a lot of things which architects have brought to, to my world, no? And, you know, I think Oriol touched on it. I mean, you know, you're, you have a very strong overview of a lot of things, you know, social things, history, art, and things like that. And, and there's this tendency today to focus, you know, to say, okay, I, this is what I want to do, and this is what I'm going to focus on, and this is what I'm going to go with my life with, you know? And there's not enough patience to say, well, you know, can I, you know, can I, assimilate myself. It's almost like you have to look into yourself, you know, time out, chill, look into yourselves and say, look, I'm actually in this world that's going very digital, sorry, Oriol, but very digital. You know, I mean, you guys are so good. You know, I'm always impressed. You know, when we have architectural students come, you know, you, they open, uh, what is it, the, what is the famous programs that you guys use? The, um, Huh? The rhinos, right? The rhinos of the world. Right? You, can, you open the rhinos and you start, you know, start making the calculation, you, know, you start erecting things, you know. God, I mean, those are amazing things that you can do. But unfortunately, it's the same thing that I think will lead to your downfall. Because I think the emotional, the human elements are the key parts and key things that you have that society really will value. We are teaching a machine to draw architecture. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You know, and there's, there, there's nothing more powerful than the human element and the emotions. And that's, that's something that we're losing. And that's why, you know, I, when I talked to some architects in Berlin, they told me, you know, they're not going to need any more architects on the job site. Because you know what? There's a beam program, there's a robot that does it, and someone is doing it. So I don't need an architect to design. I don't need architects to manage. I don't need an architect to give me an idea because everything is going to be mass customized, you know? So for me, that's the response, no? So to the, so the two-part question, no? So one is, you know, having the stamina to deal day in and day out with, with the dynamic, evolving world. And I think the second part is look inside because there are a lot, there's a lot of value in the school of architecture and architects, but it's not being valorized by yourselves, no? And what we have done is that we have been, you know, opportunistic, you know, we have been saying, wow, these architects are really wonderful. They have these great ideas, they have this vision, they, you know, they, they come from these different angles and they tell me about the social thing, they tell me about the artistic thing and we have these crazy ideas, we're looking at magic and, and it's exciting, right? But we're, we're opportunistic, we, we see that and we're saying, we're grabbing it, right? So, I, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I know, are you applauding on the opportunistic part? Because that's yeah. <laughs> would, would you like to add something, Oriol? That's fine. We can leave it like that. <laughs> yeah? Uh, just, just a second. I will. Hi. <laughs> okay, so I, I really. <sighs> okay. I think I understood your point in which, and what Oriol said, that we're being substituted by machines. But at the same time, um, I feel like even though we're trying to teach machines to create these materials and all of these, there is these small elements, like you talk about the approach, right? Like a machine cannot fill the space, a machine cannot really give that magic that we are thought of. And yes, we are taught to use the Rhino and AutoCAD and all of these to, to make things faster because we live in a faster world, right? And we have to adapt somehow. And sometimes we don't really have the chance to just sit back. But I believe, it's not really a question, it's more like I got a little bit built up. <laughs> and I'm sorry about that. But I believe that we are also taught uh, to be sensitive and to, to love the space and the materials and to understand 
what kind of materials uh, are going to give certain uh, emotions and feelings. And so, like Oriol said, we are not only architects, we're also researchers, but we also were lovers of, of, of the space, of, of, of the geometry, of the materials, which is what really creates this, this architecture and this approach. And I don't know what was the question. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, 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 will, I will answer that question. <laughs> I got um, very emotional. But <laughs> I'm going to play the, the advocate. So you are, you're, you're, take, you're bringing out the, the true architect in you. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. Sorry. <laughs> Thank so you. So I will play the advocate of the devil here. No? Uh, the moment when you can quote emotions, that will be the end of the architect, right? Because if we're Ooh, speaking about the bomb right there. if we're speaking about the emotion, the poetry of the space, the light, and so on, the moment that we can do that and put that in numbers, there's nothing else for us to do. Because a machine will do that 10, 15, a million times faster and better than us, because it will be optimized, right? So what are the tools that we have to fight against that? That is a very good question. No? I'm not going to answer. Not not now, at least. Uh, but yeah, no, it's true. It's true what you say. But we have to be aware of that, no? as Avide was saying. That we, we have to be aware of what we put on the table because at some point that won't be enough. So. Do you remember the question now? No, just <laughs> what do you think about that? Like, uh, because you talk about uh, uh, that it's going to be our downfall, no? but you also have to take into consideration no, I mean, in fact, when I said I was opportunistic, is because I do recognize that you have some extremely great, you know, characteristics as as trained architects. So for me, you know, it's been a blessing. You know, when I took that when I took that jump, I was making a bet, and I discovered a whole world. You know, for me, it was it was it was it was just uh, amazing. You know, to work with architects, and we continue to work with architects, and we hire architects in our team. I mean. And you know, if, I mean, this is really. And now that I, you know, when, when I was walking here, unfortunately, it was too late already. I, what I should have done is actually brought one of my research arch, researcher architects with me, and have him or her talk and share his or her experience because we have architects that actually do research every day, but the way they do research is completely different from, you know, what we conventionally do. And this is the the beauty, you know. I mean, the, the beauty is that, you know, that, that, that uh, I don't know, but I think that, and maybe this is a good question to the to professors. <laughs> I mean, is there, is there a point in time maybe that, you know, how we teach architecture needs to be revisited, you know, or, 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 um, or maybe the, 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 you know, the, it's not enough just to have a, a, a let's say, a, 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 school, a school class full of architects, but you maybe uh, need to sometime invite some engineers also to the, to the classes. From time to time, from time to time. Think about that, but, uh, but, but I think, you know, I mean, I think, you know, why, why we're asking this question is because I think, you know, we, we, why, why the theme is because, you know, there is this leap that needs to be made. And, you know, is it, is it just one leap or like, in my case, it was many leaps. You know? So at some point, you know, as you fall, you know, are you able to grab onto something? And you know, and I guess that's the question. You know, what are you going to grab onto? Thank you, um, Juan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now we're here. Okay. Thanks for. All. I would not like to call down this interesting debate, but I'm going to be a little bit ironic anyway. Uh, you have shown very nice pictures with Leonardo da Vinci and these <laughs> people, but one of them was Houdini. Houdini, I don't know if the young people here, young students know, but uh, Houdini, he died when he yes, uh, doing a, a magic trick. trick. He died drunk, yes. So um, he was like researching with with tricks but he died he died in, in on a scene it was a, a really a drama so i would like to talk about the balance between the the failure and the overcoming entre, entre el éxito y el fracaso how how 
how do you think the researcher, the architect, the researcher has to manage the risk of failure? It's constantly a failure until you get to the point. Huh? Um, as David was saying, like you need to be there and then you have to, be, to overcome all of these small failures. But in the end, they are not like big failures, but they are steps or things that you need to solve while you are doing that research. Huh? So in that, in that sense, um, of all of the research that you could create or that you could do, like a lot of it, a big part of it, uh, they are end and uh, dead end roads that they lead nowhere. No? But in the process of transit in that road, you are learning something else that can be extracted and can be used for something else to, to achieve a, a greater goal. No? So in the end, the, the research, we, we tend to see like, okay, I'm starting here, I'm going to develop this, 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 and that. I will do this, 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 and that, and I will do this test and this and this, and, and then I will end up with a proper thing. But the, the path from point A to point B is not linear, and it never will be linear, because it cannot be. Because if you know where you are going, you already know what you are researching, so there's no point in that, right? But in the, in the transit from here to there is where you find the thing. And maybe in the middle you find several or other things that you were not thinking about. No, it's, it, that you can see like in the in the history of, of innovation. No, like superglue was a mistake. They were trying to do something else, and, and then they found superglue. Or the post-its, they were a mistake. They were trying to find something else, and then they overcome like a glue that was uh, very fragile. No, so um, I don't think that research has a failure per se. Okay, you can fail objectives if you want to put it that way. Or you can fail cost or you can fail timings, but there's not a, a, a failure per se, because you always get something in return. Maybe it's more or less useful, useful that's true, uh, but there's always like a path that you can follow to, to arrive somewhere else. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> you know, I, I, that's a very good question. No? Because let's say that in the context of a company, um, for, for me, there's no such thing as failure. I can't fail. It's not allowed. Because, you know, as, uh, as uh, Philippe mentioned, Philippe mentioned, is that when you're in a big company, it's very business oriented. So when you go and tell somebody you failed, it's like, what do you mean you failed? You know, if you failed, then why did you work on it in the bit to, be, to begin with? You know, what I mean, it's like, you know, if you know it was going to fail, why do you work on it? But well, well, that, that's research, and that, that's the big challenge. You now, for me, in the I don't know, 18 years that I've worked in this company, it's been very difficult to to manage that. You no, know? because only until two years ago, <laughs> because you know. A group of managers went and attended a course where someone, you know, a very prominent person with authority and probably published 20 books on failure said to them, it's okay to fail, you know, don't worry, it, it, it's, it happens, you know, when you innovate. Then they finally said, oh, okay, so, you know, but they said, okay, look, you can fail, but fail fast, <laughs> you know, as quickly as you can so that, you know, we can correct the, which is, which is, a, which is also the right way to do it, no? because now the, the, the fashion or the way to look at it is like, okay, you want to be able to fail fast so that you can learn from those failures and then, you know, and, and be able to get to the solution quick. But let's say that for me, it's been always very challenging and difficult to maintain the equilibrium. And let's say that I've always had to manage the failure by taking risks. So, and be able to manage the risks. And, and, and that was, is, let's say, some, somehow synonymous with managing failure, no? Um, and, 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 you know, and not to use the word failure, maybe, you know? So let's say, and this is, again, doing the magic trick, no? So it's like, so you say, if you do something, you say, okay, you know, the project didn't uh, accomplish its goals, or maybe, you know, it had to stop for whatever reasons, financials or whatever. Then you say, look, hey, but you know, the project, you know, had some really important outcomes. You know, we were able to patent the idea, you know, have uh, gained knowledge, and you have to sell it like that. You know? So, 
it is very challenging and, and it's, it's called risk management for, for me, you know, meaning because you have to take a risk and at some point, you know, the top management can question it and say, I don't agree with what you're taking as a decision. Even though you know that, you know, that maybe in five or 10 years down the road, it will, you know, create fruits for the company. But in that moment, you know, the company has maybe debts, you know, it has to, you know, sell products, you know, and, and, and make money. And it's understandable, so you have to, you know, be able to to balance that. But in a big corporation like 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 where I work, failure for many years was not an existent word, and that's why it was very difficult to do research and development. No? And that's why I was also that's why I call it a leap into the void because it really was a leap into the void. No? I didn't know what to what would come out of it. That's why I always call my wife and say, look, you know, honey, I'm sorry if I get fired today, but you know, I t I'm taking a risk. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> well, I go, going back to the last comment, uh, I think that the society is changing over the last years, and <clears throat> uh, maybe uh, the world is realizing that it's not about productivity anymore, it's about knowledge. And, uh, and, the, and the real value of things in society uh, relies on knowledge. And I think that this is driving uh, big corporations and big companies to invest also in knowledge as the big active. No? So I think that maybe this is also related to what you're uh, right now saying and how such a corporation like Themex is changing. No? But, uh, well, I wanted to share some thoughts about the question about what, what is the future of the architecture. Also going back to Maital's question about you know, from the student's point of view or young architects when you know, when you finish and then you, you know, you've been learning and maybe that's a reason to change the way we teach because we are somehow teaching our students still the old ways. Like, you know, the goal is to build something, you know, to finish and then, you know, you are, you are, you are leads to build and, and, and to make a house or a project or a school or something like very physical, no? And there's many other applications for architecture. But I think that, <clears throat> I think that today is a special day because actually we have Oriol coming from the research world, like more pure uh, in a way, uh, you know, like like uh, like the faculty and and all you know within all the departments here, that they are we are doing a lot of research. As a university, I mean, uh, this is a private university. I think this is so, uh, a good thing in, in in like especially for sessions like today. And in the other hand, we have uh, the industry, you know, the industry like the big industry, and and and, and I think that maybe architects. We can lie, uh, I mean, of course, both extremes are architects, so I would deny the, the, the division. But for, for this moment, I think that going to my thoughts, I think we fall in between. Uh, like connecting both edges, like connecting the research with the industry. And I think that this is something that is changing because <clears throat> over the, like during many, many years, the way that architecture was understood is more like a manufacturing thing. Like you design something and then you have a carpenter or you have a hammersmith or you have a stone, you know, like to manufacture something. But the industry is really changing. And, and, and the process of innovation and, and, and research, like let's say at a, uh, like to apply the research, it, it needs the architects and the offices to take the risk and try to get out of the comfort zone and the way they have been designing and, and uh, to really try to incorporate the, the industry and the research into the, uh, into the design process. And this is something that is very real, actually. I mean, and it, it also it depends a lot on the attitude from, from the young architects and the not so young architects. Like, I mean, it really it needs to somebody to really invest and take the risk to design something with together with the industry uh, to really innovate. And, and, and for example, myself, I question myself about, you know, I've been pushed to also here at the university. Okay, hi, you, you, I mean, I'm not even a doctor. I mean, you need to do some research. You need to become a doctor. You need to get a, you know, it's part of the, of being a professor, you know, or, or learning on that. No, and then I asked to myself and, 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 and sessions like today, what could I research for? You know, what, what can I, you know, what can, like I'm more coming from a like classical architect, like designer, or coming from an office like applies design, no? But, but then I, I think that one of the key questions is to really push the boundaries and then try to really get closer and closer to the to the to the industry, like like big architects is doing a lot, like from for many years, you know, like really going forward on design, not for the sake of form, but for the sake of 
applying really deep uh, uh, innovations into the architecture. And I think that this is really a, a very good way, and it was very ahead of time uh, on, on what now a lot of uh, people <coughs> is doing. So my question to both of you, and, and then this, this thinking about Meital's question is, how do you foresee uh, in the future, in the near future, the evolution of these two extremes and how close research world, like pure research, can be closer and closer to uh, the industry and how architecture can be really caught in between. Because right now, uh, a lot of like the big firms, uh, like all the star architects, are being approached all the time by the industry, asking them to innovate and then offering innovation to be applied, no? like as a flagship. Now, if Jan Nouvel is doing this or if Foster is doing this, of course, he, he will innovate. Like, you know, you, you, sh you shown the, the, the Apple campus. No? Of course, Foster can innovate with a fiber cyber. But I think that also, middle or unknown architects should have the same attitude of innovation and the second question is how how can the public sector through the public tendering processes uh, allow and shift and change to allow this innovation to take place because uh, i found our, our own office we're doing uh, public projects in, in around europe and, and we are trying to innovate and trying to bring in uh, products. And we find out, found out that we really need to work with the, fa with the industry close together uh, to be able to design, like, like all very, very early in the design process, already in the concept design, to really, because we, don't know, we, don't have the, we, we can have the ideas, but we don't have the knowledge. So we really need to work hand by hand with the industry. But the public tendering processes around, at least in Europe, they're not allowed to pre-assign specific brands or specific companies. And therefore, you are not really allowed to officially, you can do it maybe off the record, but officially work directly with the industry. And this is something anachronic. It is like both regulations are anachronic and also the processes of design and tendering are anachronic. So how we can solve this, like we're doing today here, because this is a private university trying to mix things and, and erase these boundaries. And I think that this is something interesting. Okay. Thank you. By the way, very interesting. Thank you very much. You want to tackle the question? Sure. Uh, yeah. uh, I, well, it needs to be in that way that you, that you say. No? So if you are an architect or you are a designer and then you're designing something and after you finish your design and then you try to go to the industry, well, you will find a very big wall, very, very big wall that maybe you cannot climb it. But if you start working with the industry in the early stages of a project, a product, uh, whatever, you will get that knowledge that is missing for you to be incorporated into the project or the product no? as part of one of the um, elements or as part of one of the possibilities or one of the restrictions, if you will. No? Uh, it needs to be that way, because if it's not that way, what, we, what will happen is that you will do something and then, okay, now try to find who can do that. No? That's why I was putting a lot of emphasis in the in the interconnectivity and in the, in the, in the connection of ideas and people and places uh, for that matter. The exchange of knowledge is extremely important. You can be uh, doing research in the university, but if you don't have a counterpart in the industry where this transfer can happen, then what is the point, right? And the same thing will happen in the other way. If a, a company has a lot of research in a specific field but has no user base, how can that be applied to the world, no? Um, so those things need to happen that way. And the only way that happening is an architect that has knowledge of the industry, a specific or not, uh, depends on what you are doing, of course. No? And, and for the second question, I think it's a, a very complicated question to answer, right? Uh, because that tends to be the opposite of what I just said. You have something and then you will find someone else that will do it and then these if they cannot do it, they will um, submit that work or whatever to something else. No? And then you have like a pyramid sort of cascade uh, action, uh, action plan. Whereas in the other is a more flat approach no? where everyone is interconnected and everyone can share information. No? So I don't know if there will be a solution for that. Because in the end, what, what happens is that the innovation in these public projects tends to be more expensive. Of course, because you have something that you don't know what is it? You need to find someone that can build it. And the restrictions that you have with your uh, processes are not matched to the requirements of that design, for example. No? 
That's why sometimes innovation is seen like, oh, okay, well, yeah, that is innovation, so that is more expensive. Because we made it more expensive because the processes that we are using are not in the right order, right? So, difficult question to answer. Two, two tough questions, no? Um, well, I can only I can only share with you what what you know what I see as being the big challenge, you know, for let's say the this interrelationship between industry, architects, and and whatnot. I, and I I continue to believe that you know that one of the key elements is to go back to basics. You know what what I've learned is that you know when when you know I, I mean I'm gonna uh, you know once I remember uh, you know we were in our in our lab. And you know this group of architects came over, and and you know both of them were, were owners of the architectural firm and with their architects. No? And you know one of them said, "Oh, you know what? I'm actually glad that you know I came for the three-day workshop. You know, I actually learned and got, I had fun. I played with the concrete. But you know, to be honest with you, I had no interest in coming. You know, they forced me to. Because the the notion is that." People, you know, I mean, and I'm just saying, I'm not saying, you know, just architects, but everyone seems to believe that they already know everything they need to know. And today, I mean, this is the, you know, when you mentioned, no, that uh, we, this shift to, we call it economies of scale, shifting to an economies of knowledge. No? Well, this economies of knowledge and paper, it's, it's true because, you know, we have the means to, let's say, process data, collect data, and whatnot. But, you know, I want to go back again to the human element. A human is only capable of assimilating so much information. So the question is, what are we doing to really understand what is the universe that is our, at our disposal to when, you know, when we want to design, find a solution, and whatnot? And what I always see is that there's a big gap. You know, because everyone comes with a preconceived notion. Every art, you know, engineer, architect I talk to is like, oh, yeah, 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 we know about concrete. And I was in a meeting with a very important architectural firm. And the first thing they told me was like, look, you don't have to tell me about anything about concrete. I know you're a concrete company, but don't, I know everything. You know, I know about this, I know about that. I know, I know everything about concrete. You don't have to tell me anything. So after, you know, 10 minutes in the conversation, I start to put all our portfolio down on the table and say, you guys can do that? Yeah. You can do you know, thermal insulation. Yeah. You can, you can, you can, so, so, you know, then, so I said, you know, but, but this is always what we're confronted with, you know, is peop, I go back again to what I said before. There needs to be, we need to be more humble and we need to listen more, you know, because even if we think we know, we don't. And, you know, and, and that's something we live every day. And I think until we don't solve that problem, we're going to have very, we're going to have mediocre results. And I think today we have a lot of mediocre results. I mean, because we're never using the best materials, we're never finding the best solutions, but we find something that fits, you know, whatever is the requirements, no? But we don't actually push the boundaries because no one is interested in understanding to push, you know, what do you need to do to push? That's the first thing. And again, I guess I coincide with Oriol in that in the public sector is even like even a worse nightmare, no? Because <laughs> You know, everybody there is trying to make a buck or trying to, you know, make things, you know. Uh, and this just goes back again, you know, I, I mean, I hate to be sentimental, you know. I mean, I shouldn't be because I'm an engineer, so. <laughs> but um, but I, I'm, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm almost 52. Tomorrow I'll be 52. <laughs> um, and I only have, a, you know, some more years to work, you know. Um, but, but what, what, what bothers me every day is not so much, you know, my job and what I have to do, you know. But I think what bothers me is that we're probably, you know, as humans taking a path that is not leading us into the right direction. In the sense that, you know, we have so many capable, you know, when I look, you know, I'm sure that if I learn about you guys and, and you know, what you do, I'm sure you're very capable of doing some great things. But I'm sure that all of us, including myself, have been mediocre in achieving what we need to achieve. Because, you know, it's just very difficult not to be mediocre. It's easy, you know, it's always easy to take the shortest path, it's always easy to go with the conventional wisdom. 
it's difficult to say I have to research, I have to find out, and I have to, you know, see what is the best solution and so forth. That's, but we're losing some of that, no? But it's also going back to what I said before. I'm sorry about the rhino and all that stuff. I don't want to make it, okay. I need to learn all the programs so I don't just, you know, make a publicity for rhino. I mean, sorry, so I'm in the cat, whatever. But, um, but I, I'm seriously concerned more in that aspect, you know, is taking the time, making the time, and knowing really what you have available to achieve what you need to achieve. Because I can tell you, like, hundreds of buildings that are built every day, I mean, I think 99% of them probably are not built with the most adequate materials. And I'm not, you know, trying to promote concrete, wood, or whatever. I'm just, you know, because someone needs to get the job done and quick and without any emotions, which is fine. I mean, it works. I'm just glad I won't be around to see what happens. Sorry about that, but it's a little bit uh, <laughs> gloomy outlook now. Okay, um, we still have like 10 minutes. Um, if anyone so wants to ask you something. Um, <laughs> tough question. Otherwise I will. <laughs> no, it's not that tough. Well, um, my question is, what long-term challenges will the sector have to face on? I, I know it's not easy, but. <laughs> No, I mean, <clears throat> long term, long term, I think. I mean, for, for example, Jaime said one that um, nowadays it's complicated to work architects um, in a public, uh, um, in, a, in a public way, um, because there is no, n there is no, it's not possible to have a relation with a private company. Mm -hmm. for, for example, this is one of the, the challenges. We, we we have to break it as an architect because otherwise we we won't be able to to be better or at least to try it. But I don't know maybe the decarbonization, um, sustainability, um, new construction methods. I don't know. What do you have in mind? You always do the more difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think all of them. All of them, we have to tackle all of the problems. No? And now, thinking that uh, concrete is, I mean, we're going out of sand, no? sorry, but that will be a reality, not for us, but for this generation. No? Yeah. Um, we build with concrete because it's easy, it's fast, it's cheap. What will happen when we don't have concrete anymore? No? Are we going to use only wood? Uh, so we will, what, we will plant everything available land to be able to fulfill the needs of wood? No, because in the end, if you look at the metric tons of concrete, uh, that's a lot. In the other hand, the using wood has uh, some better benefits than using concrete, of course. No? But I think everything, everything has to be changed. Everything needs to be changed as, as, I don't know, 10, 20, 50 years. Because our way of building should be changed also. Uh, we are not building as the Romans. Well, we are. So we need to change that. The mass for the Romans was very important for us. Maybe it's not that much. What will happen with all of these um, buildings that need to have uh, restorations or refurbishments of what, or whatever, no? What will happen in the Chample in the upcoming 20 years? The buildings will be 150 years. Usually a building stands for 100 years. What will happen with all of that? This generation will need to build a new Barcelona on top of what we have. They will need to change the paradigm of, of architecture on how we build architecture. So all of it at the same time. So David, you asked the, the very, at least for me, a very tough question no? in the sense that, let's say I will, I, will, I will use an example to, to explain why it's such a difficult question. No? For example, um, and, and underlying this example is what I call behavioral science no? and emotion. Because, for example, when, when COVID struck, um, one of the projects I, I initiated with the architects that we, you know, the different architects that we worked with was to say, there was this, all this big discussion and there were competitions launched about how 
to reinvent, redesign space, no? Because, you know, the social distancing was mm -hmm. relevant, you know, like, for example, the, you know, the restaurants had to find ways to kind of, like, you know, be cake, you know, like, I think in New York, or I don't know, in San Francisco, you know, you know, the, the restaurants, you know, to, to have business, they, they put the seats out there, but then the, the then there was a whole reinterpretation of the space, right? Because that space maybe was public space, uh, maybe you couldn't, you know, put the tables there, but, you know, they had to get creative and, and so, so all of a sudden, you know, something like that happens and it triggers a behavioral change in society, right? And, and we studied that a lot, you know? I mean, as a, I mean, it's, I mean, I know this, I, mean, I hope, you know, hope the top management of CEMEX is not listening to this, but if there are, that's fine. But we studied, we spent a lot of time, you know, weeks and weeks understanding what is the role of our materials and what role they would play in reinterpreting you know, space and architecture in light of the fact that, you know, certain elements were triggered by the, the COVID, no? And that is very unpredictable. And it's also a very difficult exercise, no? I mean, some examples, I give you some really, you know, simple examples, and I was saying, okay, look, one of the, we were studying, for example, I think there were some very interesting studies showing, for example, how, you know, if you have a, you have a corner in a big city and you have a stoplight, you know, where would people congregate, no? So we studied that, no? People, when they showed that people typically congregate next to the stoplight, they would have a conversation, smoke their cigarettes or whatever. So you see, you know, human patterns develop depending on certain scenarios, certain uh, situations that you have, you know, if it's a landscape-based driven uh, scenario or a city-based driven scenario. So, so we were starting to try to understand what would be the behavioral patterns of people given these conditions, no? And we were asking ourselves, okay, how do we design so that, you know, it, it doesn't become like a tape on the ground, you know? Like one of the things I hate to see, you know, it's like, you know, you go somewhere and they put a piece of tape there and say, okay, this is the distance you have to maintain. So we were saying, okay, what is the kind of architecture we need to explore that does that naturally, but not with like a sending a signal saying, hey, you know, you gotta maintain a two, two meter distance. But so like, you know, simple thing like a bus stop. So how do you design a bus stop, you know, in a way that, it's not crying out and yelling out, hey, maintain you know, social distancing, maintain social distancing. No, I mean, we don't want to hear that. You know, we, we, we're sick of that. But we need to design and shape that bus stop, even though a simple bus stop, so that the positions and how people stand and wait for the bus automatically, naturally keeps them distance. No? These were the things that we were confronted with. So in answering you know, what to expect, for me, that is, very challenging, challenging because we're dealing with one of the most primordial factors of our human existence, which is the behavior, you know? And the behavior sometimes has no logic. And I think that more and more will govern, you know, what we, how we need to design the future because we all, we, we start to see this, you know? Like, for example, like today, you know, we talk about these common spaces, you no? Know? And the idea of common spaces and why? Because people are connected, they use the things, they more discuss, I, I don't know, you no? Know? But, but it's all driven by behavior. And to predict that is very, very complex. So I like to believe that that's the most driving force. You know, I mean, of course, CO2 will become important, sustainable will become important, but it all depends in the end of how we behave. Because even if we do all those efforts and there's no acceptance, because of behavioral decisions that we humans take, they are, you know, they don't, they will not gain any value, you know? So for me, that's why, you know, what I have learned at least is that, you know, even though, I mean, it sounds weird, you know, is that in working with concrete, we have to be very conscious about what is the behavioral, what to expect in terms of behavioral transformation of society. Uh, at least, you know, the COVID was an awakening of that, you know, because we start to say, whoa, Jesus, you know, I mean, like, space is no longer the way we understand it, you know? And we have to really study how, you know, the, this particular phenomena triggered changes in behavior. And, and before, if people were congregating next to the stoplight, they're not doing it anymore. So it's no longer the right reference, you know? And so what is the right reference? So I'm sorry, David, but, you know, you ask a tough question. I don't have, a, I don't have the answer except for just saying that, you know, we have to study human behavior. I think as best as we can. It's always the same answer, like the unpredictable future. No, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, look, you can make it predictable. You no, know? mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you think of, let's say, what drives business today, no? you can say, okay, there are these 
the CO2, the things, blah, 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 blah. Okay, fine. And you know, and we can put some predictive, I mean, those are the things that are obvious, no? I think you can go and Google it and say, okay, you know, who's, what are the biggest concerns today? Well, climate change, uh, water management, good. You know, and those will drive business, and I think that's, that's fine. But ultimately, I think, you know, the human has the final say. And if we're not aware, I think, you know, we, what we're seeing is that as we move forward, we're challenging that, you know? Because up to now, everybody's been happy to have their iPhones and, and their computers. Uh, but now, you know, you see the oil prices uh, growing, you know, cost increasing, you know, cost of living being more complex. And the question is, what are the solutions for those kinds of problems? You know, how do you make the essential needs of a human affordable? Like, you know, having a shelter and not only having a shelter, but, you know, living comfortably in that shelter and being able to provide food. And, you know, and, and like, for example, I didn't show you, but like, you know, for example, I mean, I, I mean, not doing any publicity here. So just, but, you know, we, we, we're looking at how to, you know, get the concrete to grow, grow crops and vegetation so you can feed from it. Because the idea is that, you know, you have a wall that actually can feed you, right? So I think, I think you know, that's going to become the, the, the real problem, I think. You know, I mean, that's how I see it. No? Okay, um, thank you. Um, thanks everyone for coming. We are running out of time. Um, thanks again, Davide, and thanks, Oriol. Um, <clears throat> thank you, and I hope, I hope it can become an honorary architecture one day. So I don't know if uh, that will ever happen, but it was uh, one of my ways to kind of like, you know, try to get into your world. So. And see you in the next photo, the 9th of March, Evolving Technologies. Thank you. <clears throat>